I was planning on talking this weekend about string theory and multidimensional beings and God's pinky and miracles, but then your guardian angel, Father Brian, suggested that I keep things simple for this weekend. So if you want to have your mind blown, email me. But other than that, we're going to keep it pretty straightforward. Our gospel today tells us of the tale that we all know very well, Jesus walking on the water. It's one of those tropes that is always in Hollywood's depiction of God. If you see a character walking calmly on the water, you can be assured that, that character is divine. And it makes sense. Like, it's miraculous. None of us can walk on water. Even with those non-Newtonian fluids, you have to run across those. You can't just walk, walk calmly. You'd sink. There's something not normal in this. Walking on water shows a mastery of this element, a mastery of water, which in the ancient world is a symbol for life and growth. But if you ask any sailor, it is also a symbol for chaos and destruction and death. Not to mention there's a storm happening and yet Jesus is walking on the water. It'd be one thing if Jesus was walking on a flat, calm surface of the lake, but it's tumultuous. And yet he still walks with ease at that. And the ease with which Christ seems to just glide upon the water makes the apostles think it's a ghost. He isn't subject to the waves or to the chaos, but is in control. I mean, it makes sense. Jesus is God and God made the water, so it is logical and it follows that he would retain sovereignty over the water. And that's why after this whole episode is finished and the storm has calmed and Jesus is in the boat with his apostles, they fall on their faces doing him homage saying, truly, you are the son of God. But with all these readings, it's beneficial to ask, who are we in this story? Are we the apostles in the boat fearing for our lives? We're following God's commands. In the evening, he told us to sail across the sea. But now it's the fourth watch in the night, a minimum of seven hours later, and we haven't even sailed the eight miles across the sea to the other side like we were supposed to. Sure, we were trying to do what Jesus said, but we've become distracted on our way. We procrastinated and dawdled, and now because of it, we're caught in a storm that we were never meant to be in. We're supposed to be in the port on the other side by now, but we became delinquent in doing the good in the immediate, and now we're caught up in the chaos of life, asking why God has put us into this situation, imploring God to make the waters calm again. Or maybe you're like me, and you really identify with Peter, I've always seen myself in Peter, and one of my teachers in seminary told me as much. He said, Dan, you're a lot like St. Peter. But before I could thank him for the compliment, he finished by saying, you have the right idea and you get so close, but then drop the ball in crunch time. Oof. He's right, though. There's very much of that in me. In today's gospel, we see Peter, leader of the apostles, most likely the one who kept them on the water longer than they needed to be. We all know he was a big fan of fishing. And Christ is approaching, and he assures Peter and the apostles, Nolite te mere, be not afraid, it is I. Note here, Jesus didn't say, I'm here to save you, or what are you doing out here still? You're supposed to be in port. He just assures them of his presence even amidst the storm. And Peter calls out to the Lord, If it is actually you, command me to walk on the water to you. Jesus says, Come. Gosh, what faith Peter had. Sure, he was testing this spirit amid the water before him. But like, what were his options here? If this wasn't Jesus and just an apparition, and this apparition said, yeah, come out on the water, well, Peter would have gone out and sank. And if it was Jesus, Peter didn't leave him the opportunity for Jesus to say, no, no, stay in the boat. He said, if you are the Lord, command me to come out onto the water. And Jesus is the Lord, so he had no choice but to command Peter, fine, come. One way or the other, Peter was stepping out of that boat in faith that Jesus would let him walk on water. 
such great faith. And so he did. He stepped out. And as long as his eyes were focused on Christ, he walked out to Jesus amidst the waves and amidst the chaos. But scripture says that when he saw how strong the winds were, when he took his eyes off Christ and focused on the waves and the storm and the chaos surrounding him, he immediately began to sink, for his fear overcame his faith. Peter literally becomes enveloped by his fears and cries out to Jesus to be saved. And immediately Christ reaches out his hand and chastises him. O oh, ye of little faith, why do you doubt? Why would Jesus say this? Clearly, Peter had faith. People without faith don't just go stepping out of boats in the middle of a storm. But this reveals to us something about faith in God. Faith is not about doing stupid and foolish things, trusting that God will preserve us from harm. Faith isn't a moment of confidence that things will work out. Faith is an enduring trust. That as long as we're pursuing God with our whole selves, focused solely on him, no matter what rises up against us, we will achieve faith's goal, the salvation of souls. Because while we can know that God is bigger than the storm and the waves, how often do we let our fears quell that understanding? In our first reading, Elijah goes onto the mountain of the Lord to speak to God. And God comes to speak with him. And there's a strong wind and an earthquake and a raging fire. But these things are not God himself, but the world reacting to God's coming presence. Elijah knew this, and undeterred by what would naturally be a very scary experience, Elijah waits for God to come. And when he hears that quiet whisper, he covers his face, not out of fear, but in reverence. For he knows that this is the Lord. We need to develop a habit of seeing and finding God amidst the chaos of life, not to succumb to the fear of the terrors that are before us, because life is chaotic, and God's presence doesn't always make things calm immediately. Sometimes the world and its fallenness revolts against its creator, and things become dark and scary, but God's presence is always there. It was God's presence that made the earth revolt. Even amidst the waves, Jesus was present to the apostles, maybe not the way they wanted, but in the way they needed, a way that would allow them to grow in faith. But often, even with God present, we get distracted by the noise of this world. And this is what Paul laments in our second reading. The Jews, God-chosen people, who have borne his presence to the world for centuries, have rejected Christ. God had been trying to train them to see him amidst the world but they become so distracted and focused on the effects of God, the law, the adoption, the glory, the patriarchs, that when God arose among them himself, they rejected him. So focused on the effects that they didn't have eyes to see God, but only to see what God does. But we, brothers and sisters, have faith in Christ. We are able to keep our eyes on Christ, able to walk through the storms and through the struggles of this life confident in Christ. We cannot become distracted by the winds or the earthquakes or the dumpster fires that surround us, nor can we focus or cling to the effects that God has had in our lives. The command is simple, but the walk is difficult and tumultuous. Keep your eyes on Christ. Anolite de Mary, be not afraid. You are loved by God. Just have faith.